Like I was seeing other people who bought the houses from me, flip them, and then how much they made. And I was like, you made a hundred grand? Me, okay, well, I made 30 on the wholesale fees. So I started to think like, look, if I can make a, you know, a quick 30 grand in two weeks, great. But if I think it's gonna take four months to make a hundred, I'm gonna do that. What was your first step in finding good contractors or any contractors? Actually, the way I found my favorite crew now is I partnered on flips with people like, can you help me flip this property? We'll split it, you know, 50, 50. I've already got everything done. I said, sure. Right. Yeah. If you have hundred K a month coming in without picking up your finger, then you should be able to do whatever you want. Yeah. Basically. Welcome to the everyday millionaire show with Ryan Greenberg and Nick Calpas. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the everyday millionaire show. We're here with Matt Fullerton today. How you doing, Matt? I'm doing great, guys. How about you? Oh, we're good. good. We're good. Today was a day. Um, it was. But a lot of running, a lot of swimming I, <laughs> for these we, guys. We biked 18 miles and uh, ran two miles right after. Did a little brick workout. Um, yeah, that was, that was something that almost, got, almost killed me this morning. So I'm glad we're all here. Um, Matt and I just recently met because we bought a property from you. Yep. A property that we spoke about on the podcast with Brooke Kane. And now it's resurfacing. I basically like put it out there. Like, should I sell it or should I keep it? Yeah, yeah. And I had like... So we came to the conclusion, Ryan did not take my advice. And not. he is keeping it. Keeping it, yes. I, that was my advice. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I called a couple of people instead. for advice. <laughs> yeah. The guy who sold me the houses and owns the ones next door. And then yours. And I said, hmm, not Nick. Nick's not the one today. Sorry, Nick. It's probably right. next time, though. Not everyone makes the best choices. What did Brooke say to do? Sell it. I think he said to sell it, too. Did he? But, yeah, I was like, you know what? I'm surprised Brooke would say that, man, because every, every time I talk to Brooke, he's like, keep, 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 If keep. I didn't live here, I probably would sell it and grab the money. But, like, I literally drive past, like, we ran a half marathon the other day, literally ran past the house, saw my guys working, like, bounced across the street, like said hi to my guys. Like I literally pass that house every day. If I sold it and then like, I don't know, 10 years from now, they're worth, you know, $2 million. Gonna and, hate like, your life. I'm going to hate That's myself. I, I mean, I've never heard anyone regrets uh, holding onto it. They always regret selling. So dude, I regret yeah. selling we'll so many. There's so many houses I look back on. I'm like, Yeah, that's true. A couple of the ones that we sold when I was like, thought we were at the top of the market in like 2018, 2019. And then so, again in 2020, I was like, so Matt, quickly now we're on that topic. I guess we're starting off with that. When you bought yours, was that the whole game plan from the beginning? Was I'm going to hold on to this thing? Yeah, when I bought them at first, you know, my initial thought was I'll keep all four, and then I was like, well, you know, I don't really just I, I have a ton of projects going on, and I just didn't have the bandwidth to to renovate like like you're able to on those right now, especially because it's an hour from where I live, so it's a little far. Um, but the other two that I bought were already renovated just recently, and they're in great shape, and it was such a good deal. I was like, man, I can't. I can't sell these. Did you already rent them? Yeah, they were. They already had tenants in place, you okay. know, at, at, at decent market rents. And it looks like we've talked about it. we can raise the rent next year. But they already had tenants in place, paying on time, no issues. That you know, they're three grand a pop. Yeah, and they're just like it's just such an A class like community where like everybody wants to go to that school that's like less than a mile away. So it just makes sense. And we're actually doing the first time ever renovating the house, doing the whole Burr project the whole pro process with the tenants in place. So the tenants are staying. We actually moved them out for two weeks. I gave them like a month off. I gave them each a month off and we we're staggering their move out. Yeah. And we just moved them out for two weeks and moved them right back in. And they're going to be so, happy too. And they're they're going to move into a new house. Brand new house, right. And then we're going to raise the rents. And they both, we haven't said the exact number yet, but they both want to stay it seems like. So we'll see what happens. But are they Are they side by side or are they... Um, top and bottom, the units. Yeah, side by side. Okay. They're like two, if you imagine like a split foyer. Kind of like a... Connected. A, okay. Like a thousand squ square foot split foyer yeah. touching another one. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. basically what it is. I've actually never seen duplexes quite like them, but... It's it's a cool property and there's like no other rentals available. And I had Chase partnered up with us and I was just like, we went back and forth between buying and selling, keeping and selling like a dozen times. And I was just like, no, we got it. We just got to keep it. Um, yeah. Yeah, the problem is, and I guess we could talk about this as the next thing, is like when we're doing our numbers, right? Like cash flow right now is hard. So we're looking at it like, sure, we're going to have this, let's just call it ARV of 900 grand at the end. And we refinance it and we pull out $700,000, let's just call it. Our mortgage is very close to what the rent's going to be. Yeah. So it's like you're kind of holding on to this asset and you get, you get your money back and you hold on to the asset, but the cash flow is not really there. Are you just... 
are you kind of hanging on like we are until hopefully the rates drop and yeah but I, I think i think cash flow is just part of the equation now don't get me wrong like i want cash flow on my, my rental properties but like in a place like that where there's you know i mean appreciation seems kind of limitless there in saverna park yeah, so yeah. you're gonna get appreciation and already where we ha- own these houses at i mean we've got tons of equity in them yeah so there's gonna be no shortage of opportunities down the line to refi leverage them to buy other properties do any of that so you know even if they're only cash flowing a couple hundred bucks at first or less you know i can eat that for a year or two even if i have to pay a few hundred bucks i can eat that for a year or two and refi when rates drop you know rates go to five we refi them you know, oh, yeah. we're golden you know so that's, five six you know we're golden if that happens so if I'm, that happens. I'm willing to take yeah if of course that's a big if but even even if not you know down the line they're just gonna they're just gonna appreciate so much i think that you're gonna be able to refi them even if rates stay the same and in, in yeah. great shape yeah that's true and we're already below market rent i know i just i feel like how high can the rent go right like in if in my head i'm like how many people are renting four or five thousand dollar houses i guess more than than you think right like five like yeah i mean i guess there's people paying you know five grand a month for rentals you know all over the place because they kind of have to now yeah i don't think it can i i really don't think it can stick and just keep going up i think you're even seeing it in the market now um where the higher end price points are starting to get it's starting to get a little softer in the market yeah the bread and butter houses they're moving like crazy but the higher stuff that's sitting there a little bit longer yeah i think like Right now, the after renovation value in that like five to six hundred thousand range is like where the heat is. It seems like because we're trying to sell one right now in like that seven hundred thousand dollar range that I flipped, and I can't get rid of it. But the two that we sold in like that five six hundred range, they went like the one we literally listed and sold closed in twenty two days of listing. Yeah, we um so at our our my market's a little bit less, little not quite as high as yours. So where our market, it's like the four to five hundred range is where the where the People are, you know, you're getting all the offers, you're getting all the people in the door, everyone's bidding on it. But once you get above six, it sits a little while. We have one student flip that um, we priced at 375. I mean, we must have had, I mean, there's a line out the door for showings. We had tons of offers on it just like that. Uh, we have another one that's, I mean, a much nicer, bigger house. I mean, just, I mean, the renovation's much nicer too, but 650 and it's it's been sitting for two weeks. Tons of showings, but people are, you know, they're nitpicking it. So yeah. I think that's just kind of what we're seeing in the market right now. So Matt, can you tell us a little bit about about your background and how you got to where you are now? Yeah, sure. I um so I am a high school graduate. And I don't have a minute of college or anything like that under my belt. Um, I out of out of high school, I got my girlfriend at the time pregnant, and you know had a kid shortly thereafter. And I um it was like okay, man, like I gotta I gotta work. I gotta get a job. I don't don't know what I'm good at. You know, I kind of, you know, in high school, I was a C student. I just messed around, you know, played sports and didn't really take anything too seriously. And, you know, things got serious for me fast. So I um, actually got a job as a car salesman. This is back in 2004. Got a job as a car salesman, you know, a local dealership by me. And it turned out I was just kind of naturally good at it. And I was in the car business for a long time. Um, 10 years, I left as a general sales manager of a big Toyota dealership. It just burns you out though. I mean, it's seven days a week, off, oftentimes, you know, tons of hours, you know, crazy. You get fired for pretty much anything. And in one bad month, you get fired and have to move somewhere. That's the ultimate sales grind. It's it like is. Uh, the car sales. Yeah. It was, I, I'm, I'm thankful for it now because it taught me to be really, really good at sales. Right. Um, you know, for, and I've used that ever since, but at the same time, I would never get back into that industry. At the time, did you ever think of the starting your own uh, car dealership? No, man. It, so to start your own dealership, unless you start like a little mom and pop one, yeah, you still a need a dealer's one. license mm-hmm. and everything like that. But to actually get like a franchise, like a Toyota Ford, something like that, you could have millions of dollars. And I I, didn't, I mean, I was living paycheck to paycheck then, man. I had yeah. kids. I It was just me. I was a sole income earner in the house then. And I was just trying to stay alive, trying to stay afloat. Like none of that even... I mean, it was just, for me then, it was just getting to the next month and eating. And early on, I mean, when I was, you know, 18, 19, 20 doing this, I mean, there was, there was plenty of days where I just didn't eat a thing, where I, I mean, I was broke half the time. There was a ton of that. So I had to grind for a long time. Finally left the car business. I quit on a Saturday, busiest day of the week. I just, on the way to work, I just couldn't shake the feeling that I just had to quit. And I walked in the general manager's office and told him, I said, hey, man, I'm going to, I'm going to quit. He was like, what the fuck, man? What do you mean? Like, where you have the Saturday? I was like, look, I, he wouldn't even let me. I didn't even have a car. I had a dealership car. And he wouldn't let me take it home and bring it back. So I had to call my dad to come pick me up from work. Just like I was in high school. And I was like, I quit. He's like, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. But I, I lucked into a job. Um, 
a friend of mine worked for a private equity company. Um, you guys know like JG Wentworth. Yeah. That, yeah. So there was another company that was kind of a higher end of that called Stone Street Capital. It was up in Bethesda. Um, and what they did was you know, travel around the country buying people's, you know, lottery annuities, um, structured settlement annuities, corporate, you know, golden parachutes, even sports contracts, things like that, you know, anything annuitized. Um, so I did that for like three years and was great at it. I had a blast. That's the only job I think I would ever go back to. And I would only go back in that incarnation, but um, regulations really cramped down on that industry. And then they sold to J.G. Wentworth and I ended up. And then during that time, I um, actually had a job offer from Express Home Buyers in, oh, okay. uh, in Northern Virginia. So they said, hey, we need we need acquisitions guys. You know, I know you're a manager and everything we have been, but we don't we don't need that. We just need a sales guy. I was like, that's great. We had Brad Chandler on the podcast. Before. Oh, did you have yeah, Brad on the podcast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. That's funny. So were you making good money at that other company doing, it sounds like sales as well. Yeah, right, it was, yeah, yeah, sales. Yeah. This was even more, I would say this is even harder sales. Like it was literally traveling, traveling to every tiny town. Like if you can, like I've been to just about almost every state, I think I'm missing like Alaska and Hawaii and Idaho. Um, and going to every tiny, every little bumfuck town you can think of in everywhere. Like I've been to towns with populations of like 30 people, um, and buying these annuities and, you know, I've, it, it was great. You learn a lot. Um, I had a lot of fun. There was a lot of travel, but you know, all these things kind of kept me from seeing my kids grow up too. And I started to really hate that. So when Express offered me a job, I was like, look, there's unlimited vacation. There's all this. You can do, you're just a sales guy. You don't have to worry about managing people, less hours. I was like, great. So, so that, that job that you mentioned, the annuities, you would go to different places where people would, you, you mentioned, hit the lottery and yeah, buy so, out whatever their winnings were. If they were spread out over time, you would just give them like an offer. Absolutely. So what would happen was um, people would win the lottery and that information's public. Ends up being, even if they say, hey, we don't want to you know, disclose, some states don't make them disclose their name or anything, but a lot of it's public information if it's below like 10 million. So we had a whole research department that would find these people. You know, as soon as they won, we'd be on a plane out there because a lot of states didn't give you an option for a lump sum. You had to take the annuity. So if you want a million dollars, they'd give you 50 grand a year for 20 years, right? And then you would go out and then, you know, at the end of the, at the, end of the day after taxes, everything like that, they'd be getting like 20, 30 grand. So we'd come out and offer them, you know, four or 500 grand and they'd jump at it and we'd make money. We'd make a bunch of money on that. We did one in Seattle where the people won $112 million though. Like we bought Man. that annuity. We put them on a... And there was, a, there was a heavily competed industry too. So we put them on a princess cruise, a 10 day princess cruise that same day, gave them burner phones and everything. Burner phones, took, got them on the cruise. Once that cruise left the, the port, we were freaking out because we knew they, no one else could get a hold of them and the deal was done because all these deals had a three day right of rescission. But aren't there, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, aren't there two options? Isn't there like a one lump sum option for them to choose? Right from, not all states have that. Option. Okay. Yeah. So some states, so a lot of states didn't have that option at all. It was all annuity and some states gave you the option, but then people would take the annuity. And then, you know, a year later they want to buy a house. They want to buy a car. They want to buy something. They want to take out a hundred grand. So they call it, they call you. Um, and it wasn't just a whole annuity. It could be parts. It tended to be 5 million and up, but we did plenty of $1 million ones too. That's a crazy business. That's kind of sounds like we, the guy we, that we just interviewed. Yeah. Yeah. So we just interviewed this guy, TRAs. Have you heard of that? TRAs. So uh. tax receivable agreements, I think is what it stands for. It's, uh, it's I guess it'll come out grade. in a couple of weeks or, or whatever, but basically it goes to like fortune 500 companies and like he did one with like Smashburger or one of those like big, you know, burger chains or whatever, where he would buy, um, like if they had a tax refund or something yeah. coming in, he would oh. basically buy that. Yeah. Or what? Give him money up front for money a discounted. Front yeah. at sixty cents on the dollar. He has investors that like pool money, just like syndications and exactly. real that's estate. That's exactly what we did. And they buy these things for sixty cents on the dollar, and they get them over time. And you know, that's that's his whole business: tax yep. receivable agreements. It was pretty interesting. We would just pool all these. We'd get all these contracts and pool them all and sell them to hedge funds. You know, people okay. who sit on these things. So we just pool all the agreements, and then you sell them off as a as like a. Pack. What are some other examples besides the lottery? Uh, structured settlements, people who get a settlement for, you know, who knows, they get fired for the wrong reason. They get Hit run by over by a bus. Truck, yeah. yeah, exactly. They get run over, but something happens. I mean, sports contracts, there's a couple like guys, um, corporate guys who had big, you know, structured settlements as their retirement that they wanted to cash out. So we could do it with any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of that. It's interesting. So you're working for Express Home Buyers doing sales. What kind of broke you off and started doing it? 
Well, I, I, so I started Express Home Buyers, and when I got to Express Home Buyers, they were a flipping company. They were not, a, there were no wholesale, none of that stuff. They owned a bunch of rentals that they had bought during the, uh, during the recession. Yeah. And they were a flipping company, but they had dozens of flips going on, and they had signed up with a new contractor, and the new contractor just, you know, stuck it to them, I guess, and way over promised, and they were bleeding. The company was like, you know, the company got very, very close to going under. Like, you know, just a couple months in the job, I thought I might not yeah. have a job anymore. Yeah, I remember he, t he told us a story on the podcast. They lost like $9 million or something like that. Yeah, like they, yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, it was, yeah. yeah, I mean, so all these houses, you know, they're under construction and the contractor's not meeting demands and they're going, they're suing them, they're going to court and everything. It's a mess. So I said, uh, it wasn't actually Brad at the time. Um, Brad wasn't really a day to day guy. Um, Tom, this guy, Tom Parmentier, he was the, he was the, you know, the CFO or C COO. And I said, why don't we just sell all these? You know, they're half done. Why don't we just sell them all? Just get as much money back as we can. So we gave it a shot and I, we ended up, you know, essentially it wasn't wholesale because we owned them all, but we sold them all just real quick to other investors. And I mean, salvage the balance sheets, everything, save the company. And then you're like, hey, why don't we just keep doing this with everything? Why don't we wholesale everything now? So, you know, at first it was, at first it was like, you know, this was 2015, 2016. So it was, there wasn't as many people, not, not as many big players wholesaling. So at first it was like every deal was like 50 grand wholesale fee, like every deal. We were like, okay, we're all going to be on jets here in a year. And then of course everyone saw what we were doing and everyone started doing it themselves and all the deals got super competed. And then in the midst of that, of course, you know, I got promoted, even though I didn't want, I got promoted a couple of times and I was a VP when I left. Um, it just, they wanted to expand nationally and I did not, and I still do not think that nationwide wholesaling can work as a, I just don't, I just don't believe in it. it. Never didn't back that. And so we were opening all these other markets and they wanted to do all this wholesale there. And I ended up doing deals in Florida. I did a couple in Washington, a couple in Alabama, the Carolinas, you know, I did some, but it was tough. You know, you don't, it's much, you don't know the markets. I didn't know my ARVs. We had to release a bunch of deals. It just, you know, none of the, no one knew exactly how to evaluate these houses. It just wasn't working. And I told Brad, you know, that we were going to bleed like this. And Brad and I had a lot of contentious, contentious discussions and you know over the course of a few years or a couple of years and finally it got to a point where i just was like i gotta i can do this on my own i don't need these guys right so that's interesting take on like nationwide wholesaling for one so there's a couple companies that do it like market pros and a couple of people that do it um what do you think is like the biggest holdup is it just is it just the local knowledge like do you just need to build down a local team I think it's at each place. I think it's everything, man. So look, if you're gonna if you're gonna wholesale nationwide, you gotta have a team, um, and you gotta have a team in each market, or at least a, a one guy or two. So there's overhead, there's locations, there's software, there's every there's all this overhead you have to have for each market. So before you're even doing a deal, you're spending tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on ads, mm -hmm. salaries, everything like that in that market, and then you're trying to do that and. I don't know, 20, 30, 40 markets all over the country. Like it just doesn't work. It doesn't scale at that level. The overhead becomes too much. It's what happened to express. They overhead was 500 grand a month, you know, on, you know, on salaries, on ad, on ads. And it just, we couldn't, we couldn't catch up to it. So we were just all constantly chasing this drag. And I've seen other people. I know a guy named Josh Cohen tried to do it. Market pros tried to do it. I mean, they might do deals in a couple other States, but if you look at them, you see that they have scaled way back to like just a couple markets. It's just not, you have to have all the software for every market. There's different MLSs for every market in the country. Like we're lucky. We're in a area where Bright covers like three states. But in most places, a lot of places like Florida, I mean, it's it's like, you know, it's region by region in those places where there's the MLSs, you know, South Florida has its own MLS, North Florida, all these places have different MLSs. So it's it's just way too convoluted. It's way too yeah. much. It just doesn't work. Yeah, I also think that I kind of have the same idea when it's like there's riches and niches kind of thing like yep. if you have a good market you could just exploit that market as much as possible but then you are capped at what you can do because yeah. baltimore can only sell so many houses to so many people um so matt where are you mostly investing now i am prime so when i buy houses when i keep them it's technically it's most of the time in maryland um we have one in virginia but mostly in maryland um Wholesale, Maryland, DC, Virginia, Virginia, you know, North, you know, Fredericksburg, North, um, West to like Culpeper, all of Maryland, except, you know, I, I stay away from, um, you know, Western Maryland because I don't, I don't know what's going on out there, yeah. but, um, in Baltimore city, I stay away from Baltimore city for the most part, unless I get a deal I really know well. Um, I just, it's tough to figure out that city, man. I yeah. just, the ARVs, everything is tough. I've, every time I think I have a good deal there, I get burned. So I just kind of stay away from Baltimore city and then, um, all of DC. 
So, you, you stay away from DC? No, I know. I, I buy in DC, just mm. not Baltimore City. Okay. So after you left Express, what was your like <clears throat> original game plan, and what did you start with? Uh, my original game plan was to just start out my whole my own wholesaling outfit. You know, I was just like, hey, I'm just going to wholesale it first and you'll see how things go. Because I can generate a bunch of money that I knew I, it would work and I could generate a bunch of money that way and I knew what to do. The problem was, you know, I didn't didn't have any money. You know, I had a, I had a W-2 job at Express and, you know, it was, it was a good paying job. I mean, I made six figures at all these jobs, but I mean you know, hundred grand a year doesn't get you shit anymore. Yeah. So, or, or even, you know, 150 grand, 200 grand might not get you anything. So I, um, I knew I had to, I was like, okay, how am I going to get leads? How am I going to get these contracts? How am I going to make all this work? So I don't have any money, right? I can't pay for ads. I can't pay for PPC ads. They cost too much. So first thing I did was think like, who has deals? Who knows about distressed real estate? Realtors do, right? So I started going to, like sales meetings at realty offices, like first thing and being like, Hey guys, if you've walked, come in one of these houses, that's nasty. You don't want to walk in it. You don't like it. Call me. I'll come. I'll make you a cash offer. You don't have to worry about listing it. None of that stuff that worked out well to start. Um, another thing I did was reach out to like market pro and a bunch of the other wholesaling companies. I couldn't reach out to express and I, you know, they, they sued me after I left, uh -huh. but, um, but we don't have to get into any of that. Um, we, uh, well, I'm happy to, but we don't have to. Um, Market Pro, I reached out to these guys and said, hey, listen, you guys, I know what you guys spent on, on leads and I know how leads work in these companies, right? They come in, it's a shiny new object, your salespeople call them one time, two times, and then a new one comes in, they forget about that. It sits on a pile. So I would venture to say you've got you know thousands of leads sitting there from the last six months that have been touched two or three times and you're not monetizing anything. I'm like, well, yeah, that's true. I said, look, let's do this. Send me those leads, right? If I close, if I convert them, I'll give you, I'll give you 30%. We'll split it 70, 30. I'll give you 30%. If I convert them, you don't have to do anything. It's found money to you. And if I don't do anything with them, you don't lose anything, Right. you know, because you didn't have any money in the begin with. So like, okay, sure, let's do it. And I just cranked through those. I made, I had a rule of 250 calls a day early on. I dropped to a hundred because 250 started to be a lot. Cause I started having a lot of conversations. So talk time went way up and I couldn't make it. I'd be at nine o'clock at night, like, like 243. I got to get there. But, um, I made tons of deals that way. I started get I started getting referrals from agents, and I started making those deals. And I just it just kind of snowballed from there. I just kept it going. So, who did you have to talk to at Market Pro to get that connection for them to allow you to send the leads? I, I talked to Dan. So you already knew you already knew people. Yeah, there. I, yeah, already from just from working Express, I knew the guys at the other companies and stuff like that. I knew I knew some of the some of the other players in the market already. That was good, you know. I kind of had a crash course at Express, so it helped me. I knew mm -hmm. some of the players in the markets. I knew how to, you know, I knew how to uh, evaluate the properties and everything. I knew what to do, so that helped me know how who to reach out to to, to try to do this. So and if I didn't know someone, I just figured it out on the website. So did you follow when you did this? Did you follow a script or did you just kind of free ball it? Like I'll figure this out as we go. Yeah, I um so I I I didn't really have a script at that time. I had kind of like my own call cadence, which I actually developed into a script that I used as you know, I've been used in consulting a few times now. A couple of big companies on the West Coast have actually designed their sales programs and stuff with that script. But um back then when I first started, it wasn't really a script yet. It was just kind of like what I always did. Let's hear it. The script. Oh shit! Man, I, I don't even think I have it. I don't have. I don't even use it anymore. Like that's the thing. I, I don't. I don't make very many calls to sellers anymore at all. Like most of my business is all referral now. So what did you ever put callers in place that you had to train to do that script, or did you always just you went from doing it yourself to like refer, to where you are now, like referrals? Seeing that overhead market, that overhead at Express, and seeing like how to chasing that that tail all the time and how much money it's spent, I was like, I'm not doing that ever again. I'm not hiring anyone. And the other thing is, the other thing I learned about myself. Um, and over the course of this, you know, being a manager and being employees, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a good boss and I'm not a good employee, right? Like as a boss, I tend to be more the Napoleon type, like, Hey, do it or you're fucking fired. And, or, and as an employee, I'm like, no, I'm going to do whatever I want because I'm the top performer here. And mm -hmm. if you let me go, I'll just go somewhere else. You know? So I just, I know that I'm, I'm not, my strength is not being in a hierarchical organization. I work better in partnerships and on like teams. So I, um, you know, my wife works with me. She's great. She's, she does, she does a lot of the background stuff and she, I mean, does a lot of the design, the rental management, all that stuff, takes all that stuff off my plate so I can be more big picture, but I've never hired anyone. Nice. That's uh, yeah. Overhead from somebody that has a lot of employees is, is definitely something. Yeah. Um, definitely different. I feel like in a construction company, that's where most of our employees are because it's kind of direct work. We're you getting to. to work. You know, you have to have the you people. You have to have it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with the wholesaling and stuff like that, because Chase and I have recently 
dump some money into just like trying to get more leads because yeah. you know did the cold callers the data the this and it adds up it's like thousands and thousands of dollars a month and you're like shit we didn't even get a deal yet we spent like 10 15k yeah. when we were complaining before about giving somebody an assignment fee of 10 15k it's like we could have just paid somebody an assignment fee yeah. and been done with it yeah so matt i know you did uh flips also so what was your transition like from wholesaling to flipping um, there's a couple of times. So what I, what I kind of figured out was after I was just wholesaling at first that man, like I would have made a lot more money flipping this house. Like I was seeing other people, the people who bought the houses from me, flip them and then how much they made. And I was like, you know, people would be like, Hey, look, look at the house. Hey, this is the house I bought from you. Look how good we did. Yeah. I'm like you made a hundred grand. Fuck me. Okay. Well I made 30 on the wholesale fee. So I was like, okay. So I started to think like, look, if I don't think I'm going to make, if I can make a, you know, a quick 30 grand in two weeks, great. But if I think it's going to take four months to make a hundred, I'm going to do that. So I'd look at every deal, like where I get it, where everything is. And like, Hey, is this a deal? Is this like a home run that I can't walk away from? And I got to flip it. That's how, that's how I started flipping. Yeah. I was recently telling somebody on our team that is kind of doing a lot of like the disposition stuff for us. I was just like, it's like at least four to one. Like if, if you're going to make four X, yeah. then maybe we'll talk about flipping it. But if you're like, if it's 10 grand in the bag or 40 grand, maybe on the flip, Take the 10 grand. 10 grand all day long. Like, just take the 10 grand. And it, it's a couple on. weeks out. 10 right. grand a couple weeks out. I mean, there's time value of money. Like, that's what a lot of people don't consider in this business is how much their time is worth. Yeah. So, like, take what you make in a year and, you know, and divide that down to the minute. And like, how, okay, much how much you put money? down exactly. versus how much you're getting back. Exactly. And a flip, if you're doing hard money, you got to have some sort of deposit. You're paying points. You're paying this. There's a risk involved. What if the place doesn't sell right now? I'm sitting on a house that costs me 6300 bucks a month in interest. Yeah. So, like, had I, you know, had the opportunity to wholesale that one, I didn't in this case, but I would have taken a lot less to just get just rid move, of it. Yeah. Just move, yeah. Because you move, move on, it. you get the money, you keep the money moving, you just go. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, so how many rentals do you have right now? Uh, we the, have- the vacation rentals too. Including vacation, 16 right now, including 16. vacation, yeah. The the vacation rentals, you, are you managing that yourself? Uh, we So kind of, we, so my, that's my more my wife again, hand, kind of handles that stuff, but we have a vacation rental company that does a lot of it, you know, does the bookings and everything like that. And we just have to, you know, kind of manage through them. So it, it's, it's basically, it's called Evolve. Okay. Um, they're, they're one of the vacation rental companies. So they handle the bookings like people book through their site or through Airbnb or through VRBO or booking or whatever. Um, they handle all the payouts, everything like that. We just have to respond if there's an issue. We got to, you know, okay. they, they, we have, we have, we have to set up our own cleaners, which is not a problem, you know, make sure everything's stocked. But for the most part, you know, the actual transactional part is managed. How did you decide on that company versus Airbnb or Verbo? They, um, they run everything through Airbnb and Verbo, and um, they were a little more comprehensive in their management. They did a little more. I want to be a Yeah, Airbnb is like the platform. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But so it's like a management company that Yeah, just this is a management that, that they, they that. list okay. it then for you on the, man, on the play. And they list it on their own site too. So you can go to evolve.com and book one of these. But I don't think a lot of people book through Evolve. They right. book through, you know, booking, VRBO, Airbnb. Yeah, the, we have one vacation rental in Florida, and I, I had one here in, in Maryland for a little while, and it was just like, so much work and yeah. i manage that one myself and this one i don't manage myself the florida one i was like th it's just so much more work and when you think about it the amount of work that it takes like for for me in my head i was like i could just get two long-term rentals do like still less work yeah and have you know maybe a little less cash flow but it's like there's nobody calling you about i remember i got a call like 10 o'clock at night once it was like the guy said there's no remote to the tv i'm like there is, I bet you it fell on the couch. Yeah. And like, he was like, no, I checked in the couch. I'm like, Definitely can, get can, those. can you check Keep looking, sir? Can you check again? <laughs> and then he's like, no, I really would like to watch TV, you know, given that like pushy. And I'm like, God damn it. So I went there and right where I said it was, it was like stuck in the couch. Yeah. I was like, here it is. Here's the thing. It's like 10 o'clock at night. And I'm like, I have to go there because if I get a three star review, it hurts my, my algorithm is going to be messed up. I'm like, yep. Oh God. Yeah, we've yeah. been real. We've been real lucky with ours. Um, there are two houses that were you know total junk, and we renovated them really nicely. One's right on the water, right on the bay. Um, that's a great house. It's just a small little cottage that we totally renovated. Another one's actually up the street, not on the bay, about a block off, but in a really good neighborhood. And they just they both just crush it, like spring through fall. That's at Chesapeake like, Beach. Area. Yeah, North, they're both in yeah, North. Yeah. They're both in North Beach on the Anne Arundel side, actually, okay. North Beach, and they. Um, they both just, I mean, they just kill it. And then we use, and we use the one on the water for like everything we do for like my son's graduation, my wife's baby shower. It's a nice little place. We go there and yeah, stay there cool. sometimes. It's, you know, nice little getaway spot. It's, 
it's great. And they, they make a lot of money. They pay for themselves. So we don't have to worry about, you know, the mortgage or anything like that. They pay for themselves and more. Yeah. And then we get to use them too. I'm actually going, I'm taking my son down to college in Miami on the 11th. And that day we're going to look at, we're going to go, I intend to put a contract on a um, condo in, in Doral, you know, just west of yeah, Miami. Yeah. yeah. Right at the, uh, on the, right on the Trump golf course there. Oh, that'd be sweet. Yeah. Are you going to do that for you or for him? That's uh, not for him. No, it's going to be for us when we come down to visit and stuff. And then also like, so these, these condos, there come fully furnished. So I was like, wait a minute, why are these condos? They're like, it's, it's 2,500 square foot condo, four bedrooms, five baths, it's two fifty. Like, what am I missing? And I was like, oh, condo fees are five grand a month. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. I was like, okay, okay, that makes sense, right? Yeah. But then I look at, I look at, um, they're like their listing stuff, and they're like, oh yeah, this one is professionally managed in house, so they have their, they're all vacate. A lot of them are vacation rentals, or a lot of the owned ones become vacation rentals. A lot of them are just, you know, like basically high end hotel rooms. Right. And then the people who own them, some people vacation rent them, and the one that we're looking at, or the couple we're looking at, one did two ninety last year. And I was like, I was, I was like, is that right? I called my agent. I was like, is that right? Like, why would they sell it? Like, he's, he's, like, he's like, I don't know. But there's another one that does 190. It's a down the hall too. I was like, I mean, even even at that, like, I mean, even the mortgage is seven grand a month. I mean, that's right. I was like, something's not adding up here, man. And he's been looking into it. He's like, I can't find what's in one of them. The owner's willing to hold a note. Oh wow! Yeah, that's so I was, really so I was, I was like, I was like, I want that's the one I want. I was like, yeah. I want to go look at it when we get down there. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. send me the other one, and we'll see if we yeah. can be neighbors. <laughs> yeah, we'll take a look. Yeah, so I'm gonna go down there and. And that'll be a great place. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, 10 miles from the university of Miami where he's going and it's five miles from Miami international. Yeah. That those, that's what the one thing that I don't like about condos is those condo fees. Like they don't, they could just keep going up and up and up and up. And yeah, you, they bludgeon you, you. you're kind of like stuck. And if you try to sell it later on and the condo fees have raised by two X, but the value hasn't raised by two X, yeah. then you're kind of in a, sh- you know, shitty situation. Hopefully. Um, yeah. My hope is that we can just keep vacation running it out and if we have to sell you know we'll figure that out but uh as for for you know for my part you know you you know uh, like two rounds of golf a week on that course are included the pool big big pool restaurant all that stuff i mean there's a lot of amenities for it over there we were looking into it i was like golf two rounds a week i mean hell yeah yeah it sounds like a it's a great course so we're expensive um, rounds of golf there i'm sure they're i'm sure the greens is like 250 a pop when you're playing there but um, so the coaching thing that you, you're doing, how did you like start that and structure that? Did you just like post on Facebook? Like, Hey, I'm taking on students. Like what was kind of your thought behind that? So I get constantly asked, like, I'm sure you guys do too. Like, Hey, can I shadow you? Hey, can I come work for you for free? Hey, can you teach me this? Or I get people just outright asking me for advice like, or help yeah. doing so like without, without providing any value at all, like all the time. It is, that's been happening for years. So I was like, man, I'm just constantly shooting people down at this point. I don't have time. Like, how can I do something about this? I have all these people who want to learn to flip, you know, but I don't want to just train competitors for free. Right. So what do I do? And then actually, um, I'm sure you guys know Brenton Hess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he did this the same similar thing a few years ago, and he had told me about it. We were in the same mastermind together when he was doing it. And I was like, yeah, I remember Brenton did a coaching program like this. So I called him and asked him about like some of the details. And he gave me, you know, high level, you know, he said he had one point he had like 30 students and it was like more than a full-time job. And we have five. So he was doing it, you know, way up here. But, um, he said, yeah, you know, yeah, it was, here's what, here's what I did. So I kind of took some of the ideas that he had with it and went with some of my own ideas and put it together. And essentially what it is, is they pay five grand to get in. 500 a month to stay in and the first three projects are joint jv 50 50 like the form a joint llc get the loan together fund construction together everything like everything's 50 50 who's mm-hmm. responsible for finding the deals they are responsible for finding the deal now if i find a deal that's going to be good that will work for them i'll sell it to them but i'm still it's going to be my wholesale fee is going to be in there Do you teach them how to find deals? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I teach them where to look and a lot of them tend to be real estate agents. So I was like, look, you guys are going to come across these houses yourself. And here's what you do. You reach out to other people. Um, One of our students who's starting her second flip, she found this house all by herself. Um, Had a friend who met, who offhandedly mentioned her mom had a house to sell. And she's like, she didn't know what to do because the house wasn't in great shape. And my student told her, Hey, we'll pay you five grand if you refer it to us mm-hmm. and we buy it. And so she took my referral fee and ran with it. And it turned out, I mean, turned out the deal ended up being a great deal. Like, I mean, ARV is like 550. We got it for like 240. I think we're going to put like, we got to put a septic in. So that's going to, it's a bat system. It's in critical area. So it's, that's like 40 mm. grand. But yeah. I mean, so all in, but the, all in, we're going to be in like 120, I think. So you, did you say that you, you create an LLC with these, the students? Yep. Okay. 
We do. We create so that way everyone's married. So I didn't want them to feel like, hey, we can just, you know, pull the wool out from under them or vice versa, you know, we can so we make, So you're a partner on the flip with them? Yeah. We're we're true partners on the flip with them. It's an so interesting we, way we, to do it. We do make it so that design like price like pricing things, they can only spend a grand without running it through us on, you know, up to a grand on materials, whatever, without running it by us. That way no one goes out and, you know. So you don't manage the contractors there. You're teaching them to manage the contractors essentially. So I'd start. So on the first flip, it starts out with me mostly managing the contractors and they come along with me and learn how to do it on the second flip. One student's on her second flip now and there, I haven't even been there except for when we initially looked at it. I haven't even been there. It's been my wife kind of handles the design and the management with them and they do we let them have a lot more rope and do a lot more themselves. So the idea is to, you know, eventually be able to be like, Hey, you're free little bird. Go right. fly away from the nest. So yeah. it's been going, I mean, it's been going well. And do they pay you just in the equity in that flip or do they have to pay you a fee to do the coaching thing first? Yeah, they pay the five grand to start. Yeah, okay. they pay the five grand up front and then it's five hundred a month. You know, and okay. they can and you can quit at any time. No penalty. You can you can say, Hey, I don't want to do this, hey, I don't like this anymore. Hey, there's no contract or anything like that. That's How many interesting. um construction crews do you typically work with, or is it just one? Two to three. Two to three. Um, usually it's uh, usually about usually two. I have two sets of guys who I really like that I've been with for a long time. And I make sure I keep them very, very busy so they don't they don't leave me. Because mm-hmm. you know how it is, man. When you lose a good contractor, you're in you're in dire straits there for a little while. Yeah, that I mean, the contractor seems like the biggest part to any flip because I go to a lot of jobs that I for estimates, and people are like, "Oh, my budget's X amount," and I'm like, "You are way off." We like, can get your bathroom for that. Yeah, yeah, like you're you're just way off, and and I. I feel for some of these people because they buy the house based on, you know, what the wholesaler told them it was going to cost or whatever. Yeah. And, um, so what, like, I just had one from a whole, um, from a hard money company, a local hard money company that referred me and I called them and I was like, Hey, look, man, like this girl is way in over her head. Like she has, she has a (laughs) $90,000 budget that you guys approved. And like my estimate was 170. Wow. And like, she's like, Freaking it's, out. it's like a city property. Like the, the foundation is messed up. It needs to be waterproof. Like there's just so much stuff. And she was like, Oh no, I just want to change the cabinets and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, this is like, you are going to be in big trouble. And yeah. they, I mean, they're going to, what the lender say, did they say anything about it? No, we could talk off offline yeah. about <laughs> them specifically. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but, um, you know, that, that person, is going to lose a lot of money. And that's why when I talk to people and they're like, well, how are these people buying all these deals and stuff? It's like, well, not everybody's making money. People yeah. are losing a shit ton of money. And not, and that's a good point too, because that's another, another way that I started thinking about this coaching program is I get flippers all the time calling me to bail them out. Mm-hmm. They call me like, hey man, I have this project way in over my head. Will you buy it? And I'll come out and look. And a lot of times I go out there and look at it and they're already in way too deep. I'm like, man, these yeah. numbers don't work. Like, right. like you're like, how much, like you want to sell it for what? Like you're in it for what? Oh, with my construction, everything like that, I'm in it for this. I'm like, are you willing to eat the construction you've spent? Because that's the only way this deal works. Yeah. And then when people get into it and they finish the project and then they didn't pull permits or something like that, and then they got to redo. I got one from Diana today, a lead that the guy, I guess, did a whole project, didn't pull permits. Then the ceiling collapsed and they like had like a, like a lot, like she's in a lawsuit with like, I guess, whoever flipped the house or whoever did it. And now they have to go back and redo basically the, rebuild the entire house because you got to tear down everything show the inspectors all this stuff like, here's the stuff for the permits here's where all the stuff yeah uh-huh yeah. So, so matt yeah. when you um transition from wholesaling to flipping and this is just to help the audience what was your first step in finding good contractors or any contractors to work with at that point i asked other flippers who i respected and then i knew that i would people would hold shit close to the vest so i so i i knew i was like all right look i'm gonna ask around i'm sure people are gonna tell me to you know kick rocks but luckily i um actually the way i found my favorite crew now is I partnered on flips with people. Like there's a couple of guys, there was one, a, a flipper who was more of a DC guy, but he bought a deal in Calvert County where I lived. It was just, I mean, he bought it cause it was a great deal. And it was a great deal. He was like, look, I don't live there. I'm an hour from there. I know you work down there. Can you help me flip this property? We'll split it, you know, 50, 50. I've already got everything done. I said, sure. And you know, we, I met his crew like that. And I asked him, I said, Hey man, do you mind if I use these guys down the line? He's like, no, sure. I've got like a hundred crews. So you know, sure. Use them. So those guys have been with me for, they do almost all my work now. 
Nice. And uh, those guys are those guys are great. Um, I have another crew I met the same way with a different partner. So I've partnered like a lot of times people come across these deals, you know, closer to where I live in Southern Maryland, where, you know, not a lot of people, I mean, the population of my county is like 90 grand, 90 K, yeah. you know, so it's not, not that many. Um, I do see deals down there sometimes and I'm just like, God, it's just, it's just too far for my guys that live in Baltimore. Yeah, exactly. To drive. So, so my guys, my guys tend to like live in like Hyattsville, Riverdale. So it's like 45 minutes for them, but it's not the end of the world. Yeah. yeah. So they come down and they do these projects and we just bang them out. They're, they're, they're good. They, you know, they, they do things to code. They're good with the inspectors. Yeah. So it's, it's been, it's been. So you, you said you don't have any employees, but it's just you and your wife. Do you guys handle like all the bookkeeping and all like that back end stuff? We do have an account, but it's not, you know, it's an outside account. Okay. So we do have a, like a bookkeeping accounting firm, but that's outside. Um, in terms of like, we don't, I mean, I don't even have a CRM. Like I don't even use a CRM because they're, I mean, the most of them suck, man. Like they're all clunky. They all have all these features that you don't need, all this bullshit. I'm just like, I was like, man, I just want to simplify, simplify, simplify. All I want is the money. I don't want, I want, give me the, I used to have a sales manager in the car business who told me, give me the baby, not the labor. And I've, you know, stuck with that for a long time. Do you have like an end in sight? Like, do you just want to get into a point where you're just coaching or you're getting out of flipping or like, do you have a retirement plan or you're just like, I'm just going to keep riding Hell this no, out? I don't have, no, I, don't, I mean, I don't expect to ever retire. Um, every time I've set a goal, it's just, as soon as I get close to it, it's like, another goal pops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't think I'm ever going to, I don't think I'm ever going to retire. I don't have an end game in sight. I mean, my end game is really freedom, right? It's financial, total financial freedom and not, you know, fuck you money, not having to do anything that anyone wants you to do. You do whatever I want. You know, I can go to Costa Rica for two months and never pick up my phone, any of that stuff. I guess that's the end game. Yeah. Yeah. That, <clears throat> that kind of freedom is different. Like, you know, the money is one thing, but having freedom away from like people that need you to make sure that money keeps coming in. Yeah. Like that's, that's where it becomes really free because I feel like I couldn't leave for a day without certain things falling apart. Like I could go somewhere, but as long as I have my phone. Yeah. I got to have my phone. Like we travel and stuff, but I, I work when we, I work and stuff when we travel, there's stuff to do. And the way I look at it, man, I've got young kids and stuff still, I've got a long time. So uh, my goal is just to keep stacking money and keep, you know, building that portfolio and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Ideally, you know, you get to the point where passive income funds all your bills plus whatever lifestyle you want, you know? Yeah. Get a hundred K month and passive income, then you're pretty much, yeah. if you can't do it with that much, then you're doing something wrong. Yeah. If you have a hundred K a month coming in without picking up your finger, then you should be able to do whatever you want. Yeah. Yep. Just keep buying NVIDIA. I bought another hundred NVIDIA shares today. So I know. Yeah. I just keep buying NVIDIA. Just keep, keep on Dude, buying it. That one, I, I text Jason, like buy it today. It keeps dropping. I'm like, buy more, buy more. Dude, my 18 year old, man, he, he started day trading two years ago. Just want to see if he can make it. So there's this, you know, parent setup one you can do. Uh-huh. So he set it up and I have to supervise the account. I don't anymore because he's 18 now. But the last time I looked at it, right before he turned 18, he, I gave him like a grand, right? To start, I thought that was, I was like, that's a ton of money to give him. He'll probably lose it, you know, whatever. He wants to give a shot. He was at like 9,400 in there. And when I, when I, when, it, when I lost access to it, I was like, geez, okay. He, he was like, yeah, I don't have to worry about money at college or anything like that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, no shit. I wish yeah. I had that kind of money when I was your age. Yeah. Yeah. The, the day trading thing, you could, people get good at that thing. I did it for a little while, but like you have to be in it. You have yeah, to be doing that every day, time. every day, looking, making moves. And yeah. That, he changes minor because of that. So he's majoring in computer science and software engineering and he's minoring in finance, fintech now because he likes it so much. And he's yeah. like, he's like, I'm going to get into Forex next. I was like, oh, geez. All right. I was like, all right, man. Look, when, when you, if you become a billionaire before me, we're going to have a talk, okay? We, we interviewed this dude, um, Kevin Davis, recently, who's like an ex-rapper. He like rapped with like um, Wu-Tang, the one guy from like Wu-Tang for a while. Awesome. He had like one, one hit wonder kind of thing. But now he made this like app that's like a trading app, but it's like a game to teach like, I guess, people how to trade. Yeah. And it's like all it's based genius. on the real market, but it's like an intro to trading. And that's what he came on the show to like pitch that game or whatever and it was pretty cool like the idea and he had people that compete on you know on the platforms like a social media kind of thing it's like that's cool talking, man. that's a good talking idea. shit to each other yeah um all right one personal goal and one uh business goal for this year that you set that you're trying to uh get to uh personal goal um god man my my personal goal is always just like be a get better as a dad and a husband like every every month, every week, every day. I just try to get a little bit better, a little bit better as a dad and a husband. Like when I was young, my son, I wasn't the, I don't think I was that great a dad when I was like 18, 19, you know, I was, 
But be hard, that's a hard thing to be good at it. That's, yeah, I just I just feel like, you know, like the kid, like, I mean, he turned out to be a great kid and stuff, but I feel like I dropped the ball a bunch, you know, just working so much and not knowing how to, you know, when you're young, you don't know how to manage your emotions as well. I think I was harder on him early on than I needed to be. And that's like, that's like my biggest regret. So my goal now is just to be a real good dad and real good husband. I, don't, I mean, I don't, I don't give a shit about anything else. Uh, like that's the, that's the only reason I do all this stuff is for right. that. So that's my only goal. Um, Financial or business goal, I'd say get to 20 rentals. Or, I mean, at least 20 rentals by the end of this year. Nice. Building the portfolio is is the main goal right now. Yeah. Nick, what are you doing with your portfolio? I'm getting out of the business. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, saying, um, I'm, I'm buying. <laughs> I'm buying over here. <laughs> it, it's pretty uh, steady right now. I mean, I've... Is there, I see you're, uh, the reason I ask is because I see you selling some stuff on Instagram now. I see you selling. Usually yeah. it's, you're posting about your refinances. Yeah, refinancing and purchasing. So the, like the last six or seven properties that I purchased this year have been purchased with the intention of flipping. Just because of the higher interest rates, um, just makes a little bit more sense right now. Burr method's hard right now, man. Mm -hmm. The Burr yeah. method. So we did a, we've done a couple sub two deals this year and those have turned out really well for us. But um, That'll do it. Yeah, the, the, Burr, the Burr method. Yeah, the sub two deals are like, massive cash flow you know mm -hmm. like 1500 bucks each yeah. and, but you know but the burr method right now like you got to buy that house cheap mm -hmm. yeah and then the cost of construction is high too it's like so everything is crazy. high and then you're just like you're buying these houses just like spinning wheels so Damn right are you trying to are you currently trying to sell off stuff that you have or just no no and, and then especially the ones that are locked into that four and a quarter interest rate that you know the lowest point for at least that i saw when i was refinancing in an LLC, you know, in 21, keeping all those, obviously that, those are the, you know, the cash cows, as far as the cash flow is concerned. Um, not really selling anything else, just flipping more, you know, newer properties that I'm buying. And you got what, a hundred now? I still have 92, 92 units. Yep. See, I got to get there. That's, that's so much. I can't just like the headache, like we manage properties so yeah. like i see like the just the headache and like i couldn't imagine if all of them are mine like the amount of stress like with vacancy and all that stuff that i don't know i, I my goals always fluctuate but like i'm like i'd rather just have a couple more like Severna Park kind of rentals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those like really nice hitters, even if the cash flow is not We're great. We're never getting another two of those. Yeah, We're no, never no, no. getting those deals again. No, I, when we, before we signed the actual like agreement or the, well, we, we signed the, like the assignment contract, yeah. but we didn't see what the assignment fee was. We were like, how the fuck did this guy get this cheaper than this? Like, yeah. I was just like, send me the contract. I don't care. Like, it's, yeah. I didn't negotiate one dollar. I was like, just send me the contract. That's why and I we like referrals, like, man. People like, have how the hell did he get it? And then we saw, we were like, damn, he ripped 50K on us. I'm like, yeah. that is a hell of a deal. Like, that is. Yeah, a and it's still, you feel good about it. I yeah. mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I, that's why, man, I love, that's why I do, I do almost all referrals now. And it, the way it works is like, I, you know, I pay agents five grand to bring me deals. Right. They're off market. And I mean, everyone knows that. It's no secret. I, I'm constantly posting about I'm in people's face all the time. Just tell, but once you perform and you pay these people, they just, they treat you. They're they just keep coming more. back, keep right. coming back, keep coming back. We yeah. paid one guy 65 grand last year. One, one, one woman this year is up to just shy of 80. Wow. Just, just here already. And we're in fucking July, man. Mm -hmm. She's just shy of eight. So we're going to pay out. We've had hundreds of thousands of dollars in referral fees. The first year we did it all year. I looked at it. I was like, oh my God, we paid out 300 grand. And I was like, oh man, we paid out 300 grand. Hell that's, yeah. Yeah. You know, the first I was upset. And then I was like, oh, oh, I was like, that was well, money well spent. That's a good, yep. that's a good problem to have. Yeah. Um, all right, man. Well, we appreciate you guys. You coming out. I know you're, you live kind of far. Um, no, good. And uh, yeah, we'll, how could people get in touch with you? One more thing. Uh, best way to get in touch with me, I mean, is to, I mean, look me up on social. I'm always on like, I'm always on Facebook posting memes and that's how, telling people I want to buy houses. So reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram. Um, website is chesshousehunters.com. But I mean, we, we don't get a lot of leads in there anymore. Just, yeah, you can just reach out to me on social, email, any of that stuff. I'm around. Cool. Awesome. All right, guys. Until next time.